Thank you. What we were talking about is we will start off this evening with the talking stick. The talking stick is a traditional piece that is used at meetings of different groups that get together of uh, local Native Indians. And what they do with the talking stick is they pass it from person to person so that each person can introduce themselves. We will pass it this evening. And when it's passed to you, we ask that you please just tell us your name and where you're from. If you prefer not to speak, that's okay. Just accept the stick and pass it on to someone beside you. So I'll start with that. It's coming apart. Oh, no. <laughs> the talking, I actually made the talking stick. This is a piece of driftwood from North Vancouver, where I come from. You'll see the beads on the talking stick, four colors. The beads represent the sun rising. The yellow bead is the sun rising in the east. The red bead represents the sun setting in the west. The white bead represents the snow in the north. The green, the green, <laughs> the green represents the green of our forests. And you'll notice when you look at these little silver beads, they are actually globes and people, which is us. So I'll start with this. And my name is Wendy. I had herpes encephalitis in April of 1999. And I'm very, very delighted to welcome you all here this evening. And I'll pass this on to Ingrid. I'm Ingrid, and I had uh, herpes encephalitis in December of 95, and uh, I am from New York. I live in White Plains, which is a small city, and I work in uh, New York City, and the longer I work, the more shocked I am that I'm able to, so I'm retiring soon. Uh, anyway, thank you very much. I'm so glad you're all here, so I will go to you, Caroline, so <coughs> you look at me. My name is, is Carolyn, and I'm from Riverside, California. And um, about ab about this time last year is when I had um, what they believed was a stroke, and now they're uh, now saying it, it is uh, viral encephalitis um, C and V. And so it's not been qu quite a year. Or, yeah. So this is a new venture for me. I don't know anything. <laughs> well, you'll learn a lot. My name is Kathy, and um, my sister was struck with HSE in December 2010, and I'm here to learn as much as I can to try to save her. Thank you. My name is Pat, and I'm from Milwaukee, and our son David, at the age of 17, came down with Rasmussen's encephalitis. It's been a tough road for him, but uh, he is doing well. And he was one of uh, the first person in the United States to be in test for Rituxan. And that has, I, we, we hope, have benefited other patients as well. Oh, you're talking, not me. <laughs> Who are you? Tosu. And you got encephalitis. Uh, you got encephalitis. Uh, Where are you from? New Hall. Ohio. Hi, Ohio. Mm -hmm. No. How old do you have? 20 months. 21. 20 months. 20, 21. 20 months and you had encephalitis. Oh, yeah. All right. Your, your turn. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you guys, if you weren't encephalitis when <coughs> Wendy brought this w talking stick, Carol never, ever would acknowledge, and if I would say she had encephalitis to anybody, she'd get mad. So when Wendy introduced the talking stick to tonight, she said, who would like to go first? Carol's hand goes up, and I thought, I'm going to fall through the floor because Carol never speaks. <laughs> but uh, Carol was 20 months old when she had encephalitis. They told her parents she'd never walk or talk for an institution. Well, my mother was just as stubborn as Carol and I are, and Mom refused. She took Carol home. Um, I actually brought a picture of Carol with me when she came home. She'll kill me for showing that to anybody, but I might just be the big sister and do it anyhow. <laughs> uh, she could not even sit up. She was, had to learn how to walk, how to talk, to do everything all over again. Uh, by today's standard, they would get my mom for child abuse because mom put a harness on Carol and made her walk. So Carol is the person she is today thanks to our parents. Thank you. And I'm Debbie, her sister. With the big down. <laughs> I'm Nicola Nelson, and on the eGlobal site, I use the name Nickelodeon, so if you know that name. 
uh, three years ago, I became ill with what was uh, identified as Hashimoto's encephalopathy. It is a form of autoimmune encephalopathy. And I uh, was a lawyer before, but um, I have not been able to return to the practice of law. However, I this year published a book about Hashimoto's encephalopathy, the first book ever published on the subject, so I feel that I am still doing important things. Yes, you are. Yes, I'm, I'm Steve, I'm Nick's husband, and um, just here to uh, meet people and learn what we can. Um, the last few years have been interesting. Um, it's been a struggle for her to, you know, initially to even do um, your everyday things, but some amount of healing is going on, and uh, along with uh, a whole lot of uh, work, she's improving. So, my name is Becky Dennis, and this is my third year to be part of Faces, and it's. Um, it's a family, really, and I really appreciate Wendy and Ingrid for putting this together. Um, they founded it several years back, and it's um, it's been home ever since I found it. Um, I became ill uh, six years ago. I was traveling overseas and had been speaking to a group of people and then suddenly didn't know how to walk or talk. And I went 27 months without a diagnosis. They thought I'd had a stroke. They thought I'd had TIA. Um, among a lot of other things and um, finally I was diagnosed with encephalitis which they believe was from a mosquito bite uh, which in the country I was in would have been Japanese encephalitis so um, I too like Nicola have um, wanted others to benefit benefit from the journey and I wrote a book and published it a year and a half ago called brain wreck uh, which was really what it was it was a wreck <laughs> and um, I, I've really had the fortune of meeting so many people and um, I just you know, <coughs> again I look forward to meeting those who have not met yet and learning from your journeys as well so that we can put this daggum illness on the map yes I'm from Texas I can say <laughs> daggum <laughs> hey, you know what, Becky, I want to add may I say one more thing I wanted to uh, give credit also to uh, two women who were very important in the book and they are on in our group, A Global, and one is Susan, uh, who lives in, uh, who is, her name in the group is uh, Perfect, if you remember the name Perfect, and then also Sherry Lawler, who has more recently joined the A Global group, and both were very important in with the book. I wanted to make sure I give them credit. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. I'm Melanie Alarcio. I'm a pediatric neurologist from Phoenix, Arizona, and I do have a lot of patients, mostly children, with all sorts of encephalitis. So I know exactly what Carol had experienced, where they say they need to be institutionalized and are not given any help. They get to all these problems with insurances, trying to get services. And I also see those three and four year old kids diagnosed as bipolar and schizophrenia at the age of three and stay in a psych unit for six months and end up to have an autoimmune encephalitis. So I hope I can share the little that I know and try to make more people and more of my colleagues aware. Because first of all, a lot of them say this disease entities don't exist and I can bonk them on the head with this stick. <laughs> And some of them say that I'm a quack. I tell them I'm not a quack. I'm cutting edge. Yes. <laughs> I'm Marius. I'm from the Netherlands. And uh, I'm into in the, on the website, right? Yes. Someday. I had encephalitis about three, no, October 2010, and I had a herpes encephalitis. Nobody actually recognized. I went through all the stages from being mad to having a stroke to having... One of the biggest problems is that I had uh, tick disease 20 years ago so it was blamed on that and then you know how it goes 
Anyway, I'm a survivor, and the reason that I'm here is because I also wrote a book, and it's going to be published tomorrow. It's called God's Humor, My Life After Encephalitis. I, before I had encephalitis, I don't work anymore. Um, fortunately, I must actually say, because I mean, I've never missed my work one day, and I was a CFO for transport and water affairs. It is all about the situations that you come into as an encephalitis patient. I cannot believe it till now. You know, I mean, people think you're a retard or you're crazy or mm -hmm. they just neglect yeah. you. The banks think they can just somehow take whatever you like. Anyway, I mean, it's in the book and I try to write it with a little bit of humor. That's why I've called it God's humor because as without humor, you will not be able to, to, to handle it. <laughs> but I hope to talk to you about it too a lot tomorrow. Great. Okay, thanks. Uh, my name is Aad Bostermeyer. I'm from Holland as well. I'm a <coughs> partner of Marius, so I'm a caregiver. Um, I'm 46. I work at the Ministry of Infrastructure in Holland, and uh, on Sunday I will tell you something about my own experience uh, as a caregiver, and uh, I, I will use many other stories, so I try to give you some, some lessons learned especially for the caregivers, so you can perhaps, well, there's so much information about the disease and, and, and for the patient, but not much information for the caregiver. So that I try to do something about that. Thanks. <laughs> uh, my name is Joseph. I'm here to uh, meet the people that had helped me a lot. When my daughter was sick, uh, uh, she was uh, 18 years old in 2011 when she came down with an MDA encephalitis and uh, I, I learned a lot from um, how to manage her and and help the doctors that were taking care of her so uh, she was able to survive and she's now back in school and uh, mm -hmm. I, w I was hoping I could have brought her in here but uh, I didn't know about her schedule so maybe tomorrow I'll bring her <laughs> over so you can see her thank you Hi, I'm Julia Sandoval, and this is my husband, George, and uh, he was diagnosed with autoimmune encephalitis uh, in June of 2012. <laughs> <laughs> my name's Mark. I'm not sure why I'm here. I'm my sister-in-law said I'm going to meet some really fine people, and um, I'm excited to meet all of you. We're my wife and I. Um, are here to help and support. Thank you. We're from Clovis. Yeah, I'm. I'm Kathy. I'm. Uh, my sister Chris has encephalitis, and I am already making notes in my head about to ask what different things mean, um, all the different kinds of encephalitis and, and stuff. But um, if you don't have humor, <laughs> um, I am so amazed at how brave my sister is and how she just faces things and how, how. Um, how good people are around her too they just learn to you know she's flipping out or doing whatever and um, people <laughs> <laughs> and we love her and she just has humor about it and um, you know playing Pictionary with uh, somebody with encephalitis where they can't guess anything but they can draw it all <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah what is that doctor <laughs> So anyway, I'm very anxious to meet all of you and hear all your stories. Thank you. Hello, I'm Chris, and I got encephalitis before, and I'm very happy to see my friends. Once again, I feel so at home with you all, and I love you all. Good evening. My name is Joel Bridges, <laughs> and I married Christine. And before was uh, six years ago, and uh, didn't know what it was. Thought it was an iron <coughs> deficiency, and uh, and it pa she passed out, and she was down, and by the grace of God, she came back. And about a year later, uh, no, about seven months later, she said, "There's this weird thing I want to do in Las Vegas, Nevada. <laughs> maybe we'll go next year." And I said, "No, maybe we'll go in a week." And uh, the Encephalitis Global people changed a lot of things. 
being able to see another person with encephalitis when you're not looking in the mirror was huge. So God bless you all. Hi, I'm Cheryl Johnson, and I am very blessed to be here today. My husband, Rich Johnson, is actually doing the video so that others are here. It's wonderful holding this stick. Um, so a year ago, yesterday, I was working, and I'm at a high-level position in city government, have been in city government for over 27 years, and I got a headache. <coughs> I was um, taken to emergency, and then um, by 10 o'clock that night was admitted. A year ago today, I was put in the ICU, and they thought it was my heart or that I'd had a stroke. I was in the ICU a couple of days, and then they let me go. And I was went home. Thank goodness for most of us. Hopefully many of us didn't remember most everything at this point. And then the headache came back. It took 12 days when they diagnosed me. I'm so grateful that it was kept very quiet from me because I didn't know any different. And I was diagnosed with the HSE on the 12th day. And I feel so blessed to be alive. And I know I'd learned weeks and weeks later that I was in that 2% that go toward almost full recovery. And I'd learned also that it primarily happened to the babies and young children with this version or with encephalitis in general. And when I saw the statistics about encephalitis weeks and weeks later, I'm glad it was kept from me because I wouldn't be where I'm at now at the same level. There's only like in the U.S., only one, uh, one out of every 100,000 that get it. So at the time I heard that, I thought, oh, there's 10 out of every million. So those of you that are here, I think it's fantastic. Um, what I didn't <coughs> realize, and for all the caregivers, I, my heart just goes out to you because it was so much easier for me going through this and the people who are the ones you know, taking care of the person. Um, at the high level position I was, I went back to work two and a half months later Looking back, I was like, oh my gosh, how did I do that? But I did it. But there's a price to pay. There really is. And so in the summer, I knew what I was going to do, regardless of what it was going to impact, even my own, my, my, the best person in my life. And so I approached my boss and um, said, I have to take care of me first for the first time in my life. And so I... Um, changed positions four months ago, and it's the best thing I'd ever done. It didn't matter about the money, even though money is everything when you're the person <coughs> who's way up on the food chain. It doesn't matter. It really matters each of us. And when I knew that, I was able to, for the first time in my life, and years and years and years, have no stress. I'm here today for a reason. Each of us is alive. We shouldn't have to say we have a second chance to really acknowledge where we really are. Each of you who's here is a caregiver, and each of you who's a survivor, it's just incredible to me. And so being here and saying this means the world. So thank you. I feel so blessed to be here. But we, every single person here has a purpose in life, and sometimes we don't know what that is. But it's okay, because even if it takes a long time to find that out, it's okay. And the support that's here is amazing. So thank you. Made the journey down from Boise, Idaho this morning. Uh, my wife is, has been uh, diagnosed with uh, Hashimoto's encephalopathy. And we spent quite a bit of time getting that one figured out. Um, in, Bo in Boise, there was a lot of head scratching. And <laughs> anyway, we, we drove around the Pacific Northwest and finally got the answer in Oregon. And um, anyway, it's been a long, slow journey. And um, it's been interesting. But it's to hear your stories, as everybody here is in the same boat, aren't they? Yes. You know, you really are. Um, I'm just along for the ride. I'm just here for support and um, just to help out where I can. So anyway. It's been quite a journey, and we're just going to continue on, I guess. So, anyway, this is Katie. Hi, I have the Hashimoto's encephalopathy, and I just wanted to say, Nicola. 
really helped me. She's the one that first connected me to the disease. And so, so just wanted to thank you. And uh, the site that uh, we're on is called the Hashimoto's Encephalopathy site. And there's very few people um, that are on it or it's only for those that have that diagnosis. So it's been really hard to meet other people and there's been a few other people you've really helped too. And I just wanted to thank you. Uh, so I was, um, I had a weird diagnosis. My name is Rachel um, Noter and I'm from San Jose. Um, and uh, in about 2008, um, I got mono, uh, mononucleosis, and I didn't know that I had mono. Um, and about a month later, <laughs> I found out that I had mono. Um, and then my doctor immediately said, you know, I think you might have encephalitis and um, I need to treat you right away. And at that point, I was too paranoid to sign paperwork. <laughs> So I didn't get treated. <laughs> um, and uh, so about a few days later, when I couldn't walk down the street, I was admitted to the hospital, um, severely paranoid. And um, so, I mean, it's, it's a big story, but uh, basically what's, what's great about my case is that I'm doing so, so much better now. And um, I've read a few things about monoencephalitis, and one of them is that people um, have been known to make full recoveries, um, in spite of, like, I do have some damage, but, um, in spite of that, people make full recoveries. So, um, I am, I feel very fortunate that it didn't get any worse and that I'm getting a lot better. Hello, uh, my name's Jude, and my daughter Zoe, um, had encephalitis when she was three. And she's now 16, and she's in a great school um, in Los Angeles, where we now live, um, for students with autism spectrum disorders. And um, there has been a little bit of research um, with children who have encephalitis at quite a young age, um, who go on to develop um, autism spectrum disorders. So I don't know if anybody heard of that but there has been some research um, but she's doing really well now <coughs> in that school thank you my name is Mike uh, I'm from Davis California I am with a research lab at UC Davis uh, that studies human memory uh, and I'm here today to meet individuals that have encephalitis tied with memory problems um, and if anyone is interested in be taking part in the research that lives in California, Northern California, I'm interested in talking with you and, you know, letting you find out more about the research that we're doing. Um, so. Hi, everybody. Uh, some of you know me. Uh, my name's Bob. I, uh, I'm a little different than a lot of folks here, and yet I'm very similar. I was... Uh, 1992, I wake up in a hospital uh, from a coma, and it turns out that I was a uh, kid was speeding a pickup truck, went off the road and hit me as a pedestrian doing about 55 miles an hour. And my head went through the hood of the truck and split my skull open, and I had internal injuries and a lot of broken bones. And when I came out of the coma, I had to relearn to speak English. I'd spoken several languages. I had to learn to walk again like a baby, and I'd fall down for about 15 years if I wasn't paying attention. And I couldn't remember anything about my past. Didn't know who I was, didn't know where I lived. And yet every time I went to sleep for about six years, I'd relive my past emotional events. I'd wake up, my heart would be pounding, I'd be soaking wet. And I'd go four, five, six days like that, and then I'd collapse and sleep 24 hours. Well, they flew me to Dallas. It happened in New York, uh, to Baylor Hospital. I, when I got out, I was really messed up. If I went to hand you a glass of water and you talked to me, I'd drop it because I couldn't do two things. If you tried to talk to me and there was any other noise, even this little rattling here, the noise would all come in. I couldn't pay attention to you and ignore the noise. But I could make sense of things. And later I found out I'd been a professor and done research at Caltech and Jet Propulsion Labs and a few other places. And they told me I'd been real smart before. Well, <laughs> if it was, I mean, it was, it, I didn't have anything to do with it. I mean, it and it was gone. 
<laughs> and uh, it lost it lost in the shuffle. But uh, I was seeing a lot of counselors and therapists, and they were telling me just silly stuff because I can make sense of things. So I ended up going back to work for my old boss. I'd had, I was an international captain for American Airlines, so I went back to work for the vice president of flight over at the Flight Academy in Dallas. And I knew how lucky I was, so I went around the country to seminars to see if there's anything I could do to help people. Well, I ended up leaving after almost four years with their blessing, went back to graduate school, became a therapist. Worked with the Neuropsych Group as their primary therapist, uh, was education chair of the Brain Injury Association, and worked with a bunch of other groups. And I ended up speaking at the American Counseling Association as an educational invited speaker. And a couple months later, I get an email from uh, Ingrid and, and Wendy saying, uh, would you be interested in speaking at our conference in Las Vegas? And I scratched my head, and I'm like, you know, I've worked with traumatic brain injuries. I work with PTSD. I don't think I've ever worked with encephalitis. I don't know if anything I would ever say would be helpful to you folks. So I sent a copy of the paper that I wrote for the ACA, which is mostly for professionals talking about issues. And I sent a copy of what I consider, even to this day, to be my big contribution to the field. And I've been talking about it for about 18 years now. And it's called Overcoming Anxiety, Frustration, Anger, and Depression, a Critical Skill to Learn in Brain Injury Rehabilitation. I said, I don't know if any of this applies to encephalitis, but I'm willing to talk about any subjects like this. And they sent it out to their board members around the world, and I must have gotten 20 emails back saying, my God, this stuff's worth its weight in gold. Well, why didn't anybody ever tell us about this? Well, I didn't know anything about encephalitis. And here I've been working with brain injury with the federal government and a bunch of states for years and years. So I ended up being a speaker at Las Vegas in the next year. And uh, it turns out that the issues that I had are very common to almost all of you. Uh, emotional mobility short-term memory problems, organizational problems, stress being one of the major problems that you have to control. And uh, um, so I, I just, uh, I'm here to try to support everybody. I've got a lot of free information I'm willing to, to send out to anybody, email or postal mail. That's what I do for 18 years. And I'm willing to talk to anybody and travel just about anywhere. Because, uh, you know, y you all sound terrific. It's great to see that we got, you know, the thing to remember is that, that you can go, and I, I, it's, hard, it's so hard to tell professionals this, <laughs> you can go from being suicidal, which I was for several years, and my neuropsych couldn't understand it, <coughs> to being somebody that feels like you got a worthwhile life ahead of you and reasonably happy with virtually no measurable changes in your abilities. It's all right here in your attitude and how you think about things. And nobody can help you recover. They can keep you safe. They can, can give you encouragement and give you some ideas, but you're the one that has to really do the work. And all the people writing about their experiences, that's terrific because you give other people hope. You know, the only, I was in a wheelchair complaining, I'm miserable, I'm, there's no risk of being alive. And one guy goes, well, yeah, I used to have that problem too. And I looked up at him and I'm like, you used to have that problem? And his wife says, yeah, he doesn't do that anymore, but he used to be terrible. Well, then in that instant of talking to somebody, which your books can tell hundreds of people this sort of thing, in that instant, all of a sudden, it, it changed from me being worthless where I can't do anything. Well, how do you fix me being worthless? Well, you can't fix it. It's all of a sudden, I can't do something because, gee, I had this accident or I had this illness, and this guy did something about it, so maybe I got a chance to help. So God bless you all. Figure out which one of these I talk into. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Bob uh, from College Station, Texas, and uh, I first went to my first FACES uh, was in 2009 in Las Vegas, and uh, but I've been part of this group uh, through the email, through the and uh, through the online efforts uh, since '99. I had encephalitis, viral encephalitis, in 1998. And uh, went from a wheelchair to a cane, and then now I don't have to use a cane anymore. I haven't used a cane in years, so I'm happy about that. But uh, if I get overstressed, I'll still fall, so I have, to, I have to be careful. I use a shopping cart when I go to the, the store mm -hmm. for stability. Mm -hmm. But uh, I've learned lots of things. I've, uh, most of it, I, did, I had no one to talk to except for uh, at least face to face. It was just through the, the support group and. Uh, which was a big help for me, and 
And uh, I first met Bob, uh, I don't know, it was like, what, 2005 or something like that, at the Brain Injury Association meeting in Austin, Texas. And so I was telling him about encephalitis, and uh, he, he had, didn't know much about it, uh, like he said, so uh, I gave him an earful. And so. <laughs> well, you were in a videotape down in College Station by the university. What, the what now? The uh, university uh, videotape uh, presentation. I'd forgotten that. <laughs> <laughs> well, how many times do we have to tell you? <laughs> you got to try harder. You got to try harder, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad to be here, and thank you. Thank you. You got one of those. I'm David Washer, and if you're on a fire, you know me as wasn't me. Um, I had my... Uh, Calm down, David. Get a train of thought. I had my first case of encephalitis in 2008. August? Yep. Three weeks after I met her. Oh. Three weeks. And um, I, I, the whole time when my kids would come over and visit and stuff, I'd say, I can't believe she's still with me. She's only known me for three weeks, and look at me now. Um, but we weren't, uh, we weren't really sure what had happened. I mean, I'd gone through all the tests and everything, and um, we just couldn't put a name on it. So I went back to work. I was a construction project manager for um, a hospital in New Hampshire, and I'd been there for 32 years. And I just wanted to get back because I loved it. You know, you interact with other people. You try to make the hospital a better place for everybody who goes. I just loved the job. And they let me go. And I didn't understand why. And um, then in 2009, uh, the second one, 2012, I had my second one. And that one was a real, really bad one. I ended up in the hospital for three months or two months, somewhere in there. And um, it was, it was. <laughs> it was really, it, it was devastating because I was finally learning myself what I wasn't able to do, and that made me very, very uncomfortable um, because uh, I didn't understand why I got let go from work. I mean, you're there for 32 years. You know, they think they, you know, be a little more understanding, but they weren't. Um, and so as I went on, um, you know, my wife did all the research and everything, and she got me into Inspire, and she got me into Encephalitis, and it was really great knowing that, well, that puts the pieces together a little bit, because Joe Schmo has it too. Um, and to talk to everybody about how they dealt with those issues, you know, that really helped me a lot too. Even though it was just a little sentence that they sent me, it, it just showed me that I'm not the only one, and that was really hard for me to <coughs> get by. Um, and so, uh, interestingly enough, um, last year, the boss that fired me <coughs> called me and said, hey, would you like a tour of the hospital? <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> okay! <laughs> so I went for a tour, and Everybody at the hospital, you know, they all knew me. I mean, I worked everywhere with construction. And um, they'd come up to me and give me a hug. How you doing? And where have you been? And, you know, Dominic just has to stand there and look at it. I loved it. <laughs> 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 I absolutely loved it. Um, what am I doing now? After six years of trying for Social Security Disability, I finally got approved. Last month? Last week. Last week. Last week. Sorry. Um, and that was a very, very hard thing for me to do. I, I mean, you, you go and you meet with these people. I mean, they brought me into a Social Security <coughs> meeting or something, and they were asking me these questions, and it's like, I'm sorry, I can't answer these questions. <laughs> you know, I, I, I didn't know what they were asking for. So they totally didn't understand where I was. And they totally didn't understand what the disease was. They didn't do any research or anything. And it was, like, so frustrating. And so I got denied. And then I got denied again. 
and then I got denied again. And finally, um, we went to the, the doctors that I've been to and the hospitals that I've been to, and we got all the literature we could on what was going on with me and what was, what was happening. And uh, we'd write down everything. And then when we sent the paperwork back to Social Security on the, uh, what do you call it, retrial? To open the trial, yeah, appeal, thank you. Appeal. And um, I mean, we sent them a, a pocketbook full of paperwork. <laughs> and, um, and then after what, a year? Oh, that was just July. Yeah. And so then we, we got the approval here uh, last month. And they gave, they give you like a, a check to cover from when they said no and no and no and no. And that check we got last week or the week before, now we have to give it back to my long-term disability from mm -hmm. work. And I said, no, wait a minute, hold on a minute. I paid for that long-term disability for 32 years. I deserve what you're giving to me. And I paid Social Security for all the years I've been living, and they deserve to help me too. But I don't know. I'm just <coughs> <laughs> I'm Janice, I am Dave's wife, and he pretty much explained it all. <laughs> <laughs> See what I have to go through? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, he's been through it twice. Um, he had encephalitis, they believe he had encephalitis in 2008, a very minor one, where um, it just had a grand mal seizure, and um, sent him home with seizure meds. Had, See, another one, had another one six days later, and then fast forward four years to last, you know, 18 months ago when he had a major one. But now looking at um, all his records, you know, the left past MRIs that they looked at at Mass General and everything, they think it was encephalitis full time. You know, a lot worse the second time, but they said he was a very rare duck. So good. he's lucky enough to have it twice. <laughs> I'm lucky enough. <laughs> Is that not a cause? You, you should watch no. out for that word. <laughs> No, they don't, um, they, they kind of said um, HSV encephalitis or HSC encephalitis, or yeah. encephalitis, yeah. Um, but the two tests they did came back negative. So he did have, before this last one, he did have um, two weeks before um, pneumonia. We had gone camping and he just could not breathe, just going outside camping, you know, walking the dog while I was at work. And um, it was two, two weeks after that, so I, I did, print out some of the um, records. My neurologist said, oh, you should bring your records with you to this thing. So I printed out and I started reading through it and some of the things they said on there are that um, it could be part of the infection he had in his lungs that caused it. So we don't really know for sure, but it could be what it was. I don't know, I just woke up in the <laughs> hospital and she's standing there and it's like, what happened? Oh, you know, you had another seizure. I just felt so bad, you know, when he had his second grand mal seizure that time, and I was like, oh, he's going to be so upset. Because <laughs> he always worried about it. You know, you always worry about, is it going to happen again? Am I going to have another seizure, you know, so. Now I put a pillow over my head, so when I wake up, I won't see that. <laughs> yeah. He's a comedian, too, so. <laughs> As you can tell. Can I come on? Is that everyone? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. mine's not Richard. Can I share what Carol's work? Oh, Richard. Richard. Let's turn the camera on. Get over here.